Welcome all of you and uh, appreciate you attending. My name is Stephen Jones, I'm in the faculty of the School of Music and I've been asked uh, to conduct today. Um, we're grateful to uh, begin with prayer at BYU, I mean that so sincerely. So first I'm gonna ask Don't Dr. Jorgensen, uh, who he and I serve, he's the chair and I serve under his leadership and guidance on the Oscarson uh, Lecture Series Committee. So I'd like to invite him to offer an opening prayer and then I'll give an entry to our guest. Dear Heavenly Father, we're grateful you can be here today to listen to Glenn's uh, message first about art and, and our, our religion and, and how we can uh, share our talents with others. We were grateful for all the blessings that we've received from thee. We're grateful for the gospel and, and the guidance it provides in our life to get to our Savior. We ask that the Spirit be with us today to uh, open our hearts and minds and enlarge our understanding so that we can see our potential, we can see the beauties around us and understand the beauties of art and music and, and literature and even better and, and incorporate these into our, our worship. We're thankful for uh, the opportunity to listen to Glenn's message today, and we ask that um, Holy Spirit will attend us as we as, as we listen. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Jorgensen. Um, I'm going to give you a couple of headlines uh, from Glenn's bio, and then talk to you personally about my feelings regarding him and his work. Uh, Glenn Nelson is an American poet. He's a librettist. He's a writer, a publisher, and a ghost writer of several New York. Uh, Times bestseller nonfiction pieces. He's worked on pieces that you may have read and uh, his name just doesn't appear there. Uh, he's a graduate of New York University where he did studies, um, where he studied the work of James Joyce. He's collaborated with a number of composers over quite a long period of time, uh, both pieces uh, that involve opera or music theater or song cycles. Um, he's um, uh, so facile and so talented I would call him genuinely a renaissance man. He does uh, a lot of things really well, and uh, I'm so pleased that he's here to speak to you. I want to talk to you about uh, my personal interactions with him. A year ago, just a year ago this month, I think, um, I called him, maybe it was a little later in the year, I don't remember. Anyway, I called him and said, I'm coming to New York, and I want to see you. And he said, well, you should stay on my couch, and so I did. I, a simple futon, and I stayed there several nights, and we had wonderful conversations, as so many, many other people who go to New York City have done. And um, Glenn and I talked during that time about all kinds of things, including the church's new hymn book and his work as co-executive director, along with Dr. Richard Bushman of the Center for Latter-day Saint Arts. We talked about uh, individuals he has met and known, including some of the composers that you would have seen on the slide as you came in. And um, it occurred to me that he would be an important person to bring to BYU and speak to you because of the genuine uh, uh, personal nature, the personal love, I guess, he has for Latter-day Saint music and arts and the sense of connection he has to literally hundreds of artists, more than hundreds, actually thousands, across the world. Um, he'll tell you today about those things and I couldn't tell him, I won't try, but I'll tell you what impressed me. And it was uh, the strong sense I have, and sense I think you'll have as you leave, of someone who cares deeply about trying to gather the stories and the artifacts of the lives of people who are Latter-day Saints and who make art of all kinds, because there's something there that's really important in us knowing ourselves as individuals. And I can't think of a better, more appropriate message for BYU students than to hear the stories of others and to think about uh, the stories that I think will allow you to think about your own life and discover something unique about yourself. Would you please welcome Glenn Nelson. Hi, everyone. Okay, stop clapping. That cuts into my time. Okay, I think we got. All right, here we go. I'm kidding.
So you might be wondering who these people are. I'm on the screen behind me. They are your musical cousins. And my plan today is to talk about how you're related to them and why that relationship matters. I want to thank Stephen for being super kind and also being such a good house guest. And um, I hope I don't mess up too much uh, with this presentation. My goal, though, is that it can be something fun for you. And my hope is that it gives you some information that will be interesting for you to consider. So off we go. <clears throat> I used to go uh, shopping at this incredible music store. Uh, Joseph Pedelson Music House was directly behind Carnegie Hall. And it was like this multi-story building. And you could buy anything there, sheet music. So I'm a relatively bad uh, pianist. We won't be using that instrument today. And I didn't come with the great uh, music education that you all have. So I had to go to these stores and find composer by composer um, music to play. And I felt each time that I discovered someone new that I was holding in my hand a piece of the puzzle, this mysterious puzzle that is the history of music. There used to be at Pedelson's this huge poster, and I, can't, I couldn't find it. Ah! Um, I, I really looked, but I did find a jazz version of it that was kind of like a family tree of composers. The 20th century um, poster for composers listed them in groups that were very similar to our family group sheets in the church. And uh, it traced their roots, their artistic roots, and it answered questions like, what was their music like? Who were their peers? Who were their influencers? And it showed how the composers evolved, too. They might have started in one stylistic group and broken off and formed other relationships. And, uh, and so this poster then suggested to me the way that connections happen, and it always charted with lines and graphics and things. So I'm fascinated, I'm fascinated about this idea of charting artistic roots. So I'll ask you now, how were you formed artistically? If you had to come up with your own chart, imagine it. Like, how, who were the people who taught you? And who were the people who taught those people? These kinds of pedigrees aren't unusual in professional music even today. Many people can trace who their teachers and their teachers' teachers were. I used, I worked for a while with Grant Johannesson, a world famous concert pianist, when he was writing his autobiography. And he was very proud to tell me that he had studied with Egon Petri, who had studied with Pedereski and Busoni. And Grant's mentor was Robert Casada Sue, who had collaborated directly with Maurice Ravel. And Grant gave them credit in part for his own artistic nature. And for me, this goes beyond name dropping, doesn't it? It's more than the ability of our teachers to open doors for us, but rather transcends that and moves more into, um, into their influence. Schools of thought continue after you graduate from school. And uh, it's informed by your peers, by the way that you make music with them. Um, the further... Um, Let's, let's talk for a second about your artistic pedigree. OK, so if you can imagine your own artistic pedigree, it gets big really fast. So you have your, yourself, and then you have your teachers and their peers and teachers, and those people's teachers and their peers. And um, the farther these names are removed from you, the more distant they feel. And yet, regarding influence, these distant people very likely have shaped your artistic life in powerful and lasting ways, even without your knowing it. We like to think sometimes of creative artists and performing artists that we're all individual geniuses, but no one can escape influence. And you can't live without influencing others either. Of all the concepts of the gospel, one of the favorites, one of the things that is most meaningful to me is this concept that we're all connected to each other. We're called brothers and sisters for a reason. And I love the idea that if we go back far enough, we're connected to every person who's ever lived. And all of those people are chartably related to us. The lines of influence extend to you, even though it's hard to pinpoint how. So I have a little story to illustrate this. I had a phone call a couple of months ago from a high school friend named Edna that I haven't seen since high school. And, um, I'm very old, and this, so this was not recent graduation from high school. And uh, she said, hey, I'm coming to New York. I'd like to get some advice on uh, um, touristy stuff. And so we caught up, and we reminisced, and we told each other what we had been doing in the last 400 years since high school. And she said that she had recently taken a 23andMe DNA test 
Turns out she, had a, she has a half-sister that she never knew anything about. And they met, and now they get together for one weekend a year, and that's why they were coming to New York. And she said to me that, um, you know, they share one parent, but didn't grow up in the same region of the country, didn't have the same religious background, didn't have much in common at all, except for their, this shared connection. They didn't know anything about each other at all. Neither of them did. Yet Edna tells me that now she feels whole. She sees so much of herself in her half-sister that she can't imagine not knowing her. For Edna, the experience isn't a question of direct influence, right? Because she was in her mid-50s before she even knew that this half-sister existed. But it touches on something about the richness of the acquisition of the bigger picture. And that connection with its paradoxical sameness has changed her. I'd suggest to you that your artistic pedigree is like that. If you were to encounter an artistic half-sister on the other side of the country, even one that had no direct influence to you, it could change you because it would give you a fuller picture of who you are. I state that with some authority because for the last 30 years or so I've been in the artistic 23andMe business. Um, I, at first it was a hobby and then I founded this organization called Mormon Artist Group and uh, as uh, was just mentioned, I am now a co-executive director of the Center for Latter-day Saint Arts. And throughout these things, I've made it a goal of my mind to find artists in the church that we don't know and connect them to others and to tell their stories and to enlarge the canon. The dangers of not doing this, it seems to me, are significant. Okay, so, um, and also, you know, it's been fun, like the slew thing and networking have produced some of the great joys of my life. So for the rest of my time today, what I'd like to do is tell three stories of composers that I've um, encountered who were unknown or, or dr dramatically underknown in our culture and suggest to you how in their integration has changed me and how I believe broadening your known artistic pedigree could change you. Does that sound good? Okay, so we, before we get to that, I should say that theologians and clergy folk don't spend a lot of time thinking about the word culture. For them, it feels other than, it feels less than. But for me, culture connects with identity directly. And I can't disassociate who I am from what I believe. So for me, culture then is an important part of my belief system. The guru of organizational culture, this was a slide that I was going to say, and there, I'm sure there will be some people who want to see me and the slide together. Good. <laughs> Done. Organizational, organizational guru was named um, Edgar Schein. He said that there are three components of culture. There are three layers of it. The artifacts of culture, um, our symbols and our signs and our products, its espoused values, the things we say we believe, and the basic assumptions, the, the, reason, the aspects in a culture that describe the way things really are. The things I'm talking about today are my attempt to discuss our culture, specifically today our musical culture, rather than to perpetuate an edited, limited, or regionalized version of our culture. So my goal is to be as full as I possibly can. One of my hobbies has been to um, document as fully as possible the artists of the church. And so a few years ago, I got this idea to begin a comprehensive study of our composers, past and present, in all genre. What I wanted to know is how many of them I could find and what, and what their music was like. The grid on the screen contains just 90 of these composers who are members of the church. As I encountered names, I looked them up and cataloged their work, jotted down their addresses and emails and websites. I made notes of articles and dissertations and books written by them or about them. If they're alive, I wrote letters to them, and I talked with them on the phone and got to know them. Um, the database got big. It's about 1,600 names. And if I were to get really serious about it, I suspect that number could easily double. Around 100 of them have PhDs or DMAs in music composition. And I've cataloged about 50,000 of their works in substantial detail with up to 30 data points for each known composition. I was on BYU campus for something or other in around 2015, and I had a little time on my hands, so I went to the Harold B. Lee Library. And in the music stacks, um, there's, a, there's, a, um, there's a section of the music stacks that are just for students' dissertations 
and theses projects that are bound together, those scores. And I came across this name, Raymond Conrad Fuller, or Ramon Conrad Fuller. I didn't know how to pronounce it. And I, I saw the piece that he wrote for his master's thesis, Concerto for Piano and Chamber Band. And I knew that it had been pre premiered on, at BYU on May 14th, 1958, but that was all I knew. And, um, and it was frustrating because I wanted to know more, but I had no idea how to find more. And I wondered, whatever happened to him? And so I, I began a little bit of a search. Um, on Google, on, on google.org machine, <laughs> very, I'm very, very old, um, I, I searched his name and I got a few hits. Um, I, found, there was a, I, I found a compositional credit for a piece called Music for Two Channel Tape and Two Percussionists in the library of the Illinois, uh, at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, which was part of a PhD program, but it didn't give his full name, so I wasn't sure if it was the Fuller I was looking for or not. When I searched for just Raymond Fuller, I got some additional hits, but I could tell that some of the, the, uh, the majority of them were not connected to anything with music. But there were a couple, though, that were tantalizing. One was a co-author credit with a Fuller with Leisure and Hiller. So that's interesting because that name rang a bell with, with me a little bit, and I got sidetracked reading about Hiller, who was a pioneer in the use of the computer as a compositional tool in the 1950s. So that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty early for music and computers. He founded the Experimental Music Studio at the University of Illinois, and Hiller ended up teaching at the University of Buffalo alongside of a bunch of amazing mid-century composers, including Lucas Foss and Morton Feldman. If Fuller were connected to any of these figures, I thought this would be uh, major. You can imagine, though, like it's a really frustrating thing to only have tidbits of information. Like in the back of your mind, you hope that they will, the dots will all align, but you're pretty sure that they won't. But I, I still felt that I had to continue. So I went to the University of Buffalo Library website because that's where Hiller taught, and, and they had three scores of uh, Fuller's. And I had already seen those. They weren't new to me, but I thought, why would Buffalo even have them if he hadn't taught there? or studied there. The card catalog said that Fuller was born in 1930, which would make him about 85 years old at the time, and so I did some obituary checks and I went to familysearch.org but didn't find anything there. So I thought, well, could he still be alive? And so I went to the white pages. Um, and another thing I should say is, other than his gradua graduation from BYU, I, I had really no reason to think that he was a member of the church. There was no other evidence to suggest that. But I decided that I would you know, try to track down the leads that I had. So I went to the white pages and I just typed uh, his name. And up came Raymond C. Fuller in Harvey, Illinois. Okay, that could be the Illinois connection. There was a Raymond C. Fuller in McCalla, Alabama, and a Raymond Conrad Fuller in St. George, Utah. I thought, okay, well that's possible. That could be something. So, um, so I, I called his phone, I called the number, I should also say, cold calling is my least favorite thing to do in the entire world. If I were a salesperson, I'm sure I would just starve uh, and die, but I just felt so compelled to do it. And I also felt, who else will ever do it? That was another part of the motivation for me. So I called the number, the phone rang, and then it went to the message saying that it, that it had been disconnected. So I went to high school in St. George, uh, Dixie High Flyer, class of 18, 30, and sort of on a whim, I called my old girlfriend, Sherry, and I said, can you look up on your local phone book and see this guy? And so she had the same number that I did, and I, I was a little dejected. And then she said, well, it's kind of close. I could just drive over there if you want. Like, I could just go knock on his door. So I said, oh, cool. So she goes over and knocks on his door, and I'm very happy about that. And then she called back a little while and said, you know, sorry. I went to the door, no one was there, but when I was there, there was a little neighbor girl, she came over, and she said that that family, the Fullers, had just moved um, to Salt Lake. And so Sherry gave this little girl her phone number, and that was, that was all I, I got. And so Sherry called me with that information, and I was a bit dejected. And then she called back a little while later, turns out, smart little eight-year-old, goes home, tells her mom about this, the mom calls Sherry and says, they just left, they went to, they went to um, northern Utah, would you like the phone number of their adult daughter? 
So I got that phone number and called it. Again, cold calling, hate that. Um, and I, it went to voicemail, another thing that I'm not really fond of. And, she, and I left this message and I said, hey, I'm Glenn Nelson and I'm researching the music of Ramon Conrad Fuller. And if you don't mind, can you call me back? And no one called me back. And so I was a little bit sad about that. And then I received the most wonderful phone call. So um, I had been pronouncing his name like in my floweriest Spanish, Ramon. But actually he's Scandinavian and it's Raymond Conrad Fuller and his daughter's name is Ramona. And so we chatted then and uh, many times after and it turns out that he was the composer that I had found earlier. He was a returned LDS missionary, he graduated from BYU. He received his PhD in Illinois and then taught at Buffalo, but he left teaching eventually and retired to St. George, Utah. Lately he had been experiencing some memory troubles and so they brought him and his wife up to northern Utah to live closer to them. At the same time, as it turns out, that I, was I began researching Raymond Conrad Fuller, the family was boxing up a lifetime of recordings, documents, book manuscripts, and scores. They were overwhelmed with it, justifiably. What were they supposed to do with a basement full of a lifetime's worth of documents? Ramona spoke to me through tears and she said that my call was an answer to prayer. And a few weeks later, I was at Ramona's table, cataloging boxes and boxes of work. And we listened to the music together, and it was exactly what I hoped it would be, a stringent, gorgeous, avant-garde, computer-manipulated, atonal, fascinating, fresh, adventurous, and brainy music from the 1950s through 2014. Here were works performed at Carnegie Hall, used for a documentary on the artist Sam Francis, played at the Albert Knox Museum, and by important performing ensembles there and elsewhere. Here were letters from famous composers all over the world seeking to wrap their brains around how a computer might um, affect their compositional processes. If you are looking for a pivotal pedigree of a fine art composer of the period, here it was. Furthermore, it was music that virtually nobody else knew anything about. Quite a story. I met him that night. Um, it's almost a sacred experience that I'm not going to tell you. It was just, it was one of the great nights of my life. Um, emotionally, apparently, now, too. Ultimately, I was able to uh, document 101 compositions, everything from a symphony to choral works, chamber string and brass works, piano composition works for orchestra, music for the stage, music for electronics and ensembles, hymns, songs, and a few arrangements of LDS hymns. And that number doesn't even include the numerous studies and notebooks full of ideas and fragments and the large manuscripts on music theory for the age of the computer. During the next few days as I was talking with people in Salt Lake City and Provo, I told them a little bit about Fuller, how they had this um, unknown composer in their midst and I kept thinking, wouldn't it be amazing if we could, if I could somehow encourage somebody to publish a little of this music, if we could put together a program and perform some piece of his music in concert that he and his wife and family could attend before it's too late, if we could find a repository for this music that represents an era of such radical change and experimentation. But could I manage it? I'm just one guy. I'm happy to report to you, thanks to some people sitting on the front row, that the Herald B. Lee Library acquired this full collection of papers. And last year I organized a concert in Salt Lake City of his uh, string quartet and piano works. And um, I told the people in the attendance, this was part of a Center for Latter-day Saint Arts event, and I told them about my journey to discover Raymond just as I've talked with you. And uh, I pointed to a man on the second row who, uh, you know, none of them had noticed or bothered to notice. And I said, ladies and gentlemen, Raymond Conrad Fuller. And I was like less emotional then as I am now. It's funny. Because I'm older, and that's what older people do. <laughs> After the event was over, uh, Claudia Bushman uh, came up to me and she said, if the center never does another thing, tonight will have made all of our work worth it. Cool story. James W. McConkie was the brother of Bruce, Apostle Bruce R. McConkie. Not a musical family, um, but James was. 
and he graduated from Columbia University with a PhD in music composition. Immediately thereafter, got a, won a Fulbright to study in Paris with composer Arthur Onegger and the great Nadia Boulanger, who taught basically anybody who matters in the 20th century. So close was Nadia to, the, to McConkie's three young children that she considered herself to be their godmother. Both Onegger and Nadia uh, thought so highly of McConkie's music and potential that they urged him to stay in Paris for a second year to study. He had already written a bunch of music, piano and chamber music and choral music, but having already served a mission for the church and also served serving in the military, he was eager to get a job. So they came back to the United States and he landed a position at the University of Minnesota. This coincided with the 1950s polio epidemic and all three of McConkie's children contracted polio. And although the parents were warned to stay clear of them, McConkie couldn't help himself. He leaned over and kissed his stricken son, contracted polio himself, and died two weeks later. The children recovered, and as they grew, the pain and, lo and their loss forced them and their mother to box up all this music. In their grief, which lingers to various degrees to this day, it was just too much. For me, this is one of the great ifs of our culture. McConkie was poised for an important career in fine art music. And given the prominence of his family in the church, at the very least, I don't think it's much of a stretch of imagination to think that he would be known by every member of the church by 2019 had he lived and continued composing in his earlier trajectory. Instead, no one outside the family knew his music at all. But something wonderful has happened in the last few years. Some of McConkie's grandchildren have become professional musicians, and little by little, their parents, McConkie's three children, have permitted some of this music to be performed and copies placed in library collections. So far, it's not been published widely. At our salon concert, Jared Oakes played a few piano works, and the Zion String Quartet played his string quartet with Kelly McConkie Stewart on cello. The emotions were still raw that night as James W. McConkie's three adult children listened to the concert. Our own Scott Holden, I don't know where you're sitting, but you're wonderful, we love you, also performed a bit of McConkie's music in Carnegie Hall last year at the LDS Center Art Festival in New York with McConkie's children in the audience. And in June of this last year, the three children were again in the audience at the Center for Latter-day Saint Arts 2019 Festival on the campus of Columbia University, across the street from where James had studied some 60 years earlier, where Davey and Jamie Erickson, McConkie's grandchildren, performed an excerpt from their play with music about the discovery of the family's musical heritage and struggle called The Night Song. Um, Davey's here today, and I can't think of a better project for BYU to mount than this. I'm aware that this is still a painful thing for the family. I hear it in their voices, I see it in their eyes, but I also see that they're aware of how powerful this story is, however tragic, and that the love and loss and the redemptive, the redemptive recovery, rediscovery of it is healing to other people in addition to their own family. I only have time for one more story, although I have hundreds more I could tell across the art disciplines. I came across the name Francisco Esteves when I was working on this composer database. In 1995, BYU's great uh, teacher, Merrill Bradshaw, had created a list of church composers, and one of the citations was Francisco Esteves, Madrid, Spain, actively composing. But that was all we knew. It was really frustrating because we couldn't find anything more about him. Um, I looked online and got almost nowhere, but I live uh, a couple of blocks away from Lincoln Center's Performing Arts Library, and there, turns out, they, have, they had uh, copies of two works, so I made arrangements to go and look at them. They're beautiful copies. One was, um, let's see, one was called uh, Homenage a Marcel Duchamp, Homage to Marcel Duchamp for harp and guitar using extended techniques, which is fascinating. And the other was a piece for solo piano titled Huegos, Games. So again, mediocre pianist. I sat down to my keyboard, put on the headphones, and opened the score. I played the first page and had to stop. It was like being hit by a thunderbolt. I immediately sensed that I was in the presence of something profound. 
ooh, I whispered because it was in a library and I couldn't speak very loudly. I said, this guy is the real deal. So not knowing if this were the same Francisco Esteves that Bradshaw had listed, Francisco Esteves is not a particularly unusual name really in Spain. I was desperate to find more. Um, so I ended up on this chat room of music fans of contemporary fine art music in Spain. Like, that's a subculture of a subculture of a, of a subculture for you. And then I ended up chatting with this guy on the chat room who's only known as Silver Surfer. But it turns out that he had taped off the radio in the 70s and 80s some of Aceves' music. And he didn't know much, about, much more about that. He didn't know if he was still alive or anything really about his biography. Meanwhile, a friend of mine who was a senior at BYU at the time was doing a summer internship in uh, New York City and I showed him the Wago score and I played for him a recording that I had recently found and his name is Nathan Thatcher. And Nate agreed with me, with me that this was potentially uh, an important find. And like, you know, Nate, his Spanish is terrific. He, uh, he, he was in your compositional program, so his training is wonderful. He's a composer himself. So I fantasized about just sending him to Madrid, like to knock on the door um, of Francisco. And essentially that's what happened. On Facebook, I, I, found a friend, I found a composer of the church in Spain who had Francisco's email, and we gave that to Nate, and Nate and Francisco started an email um, communication in fits and starts, and ultimately I paid for a ticket and sent him to Madrid. And he just showed up at Francisco's sacrament meeting. Francisco was in the bishopric in a suburb just right outside of, of uh, Madrid. And um, over the next few days, Nate and Francisco, whose nickname is Paco, cataloged his works and built a lasting friendship. I commissioned Nate to write a book in 2016 about the experience of discovering Estevez, which is titled Paco, an amazing book. It changed Francisco's life, and I'd suggest that it also changed Nate's life. The musical pedigree of Francisco Estevez might be the most impressive of any artist in the church. Uh, that's not a statement I make casually. Estevez studied in Spain with Gerardo Gambao, after meeting a visiting German composer, Gunter Becker, Esteves moved to Dusseldorf to study with him. There he studied with Becker and Milko Kellermann. He became associated with Darmstadt. He worked with Bernd Weissmann. He was friends with Benjamin Britten. He studied with Olivier Messiaen and credited Messiaen's spirituality with his own spiritual quest, which led to his conversion to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in 1982. It's mostly a cold that I have. <laughs> he composed award-winning music and received advanced degrees in three different countries. Meanwhile, he was part of the music scene that was focusing at the time on electronic sounds in popular music, and Esteves performed with the groundbreaking band Kraftwerk on numerous occasions. I can't recommend to you highly enough his music. His piano quintet, Canto de Vida y Esperanza, Song of Life and Hope, was written in direct response to the Madrid terrorist bombings just weeks after they happened. And it has all the hallmarks of a masterpiece to me. It's on YouTube. You can, you can listen to it. His works draw from the gospel in subtle and direct ways as well. A massive composition that's still to be premiered and would be very welcome on this campus, and I'm sure he'd come for the premiere, is El Sueño de Leji, Lehi's Dream. In the last four years, as I've engaged um, Latter-day Saint performers and arts organizations regarding his music, Scott, Jennifer Wells Babbage, the Deseret String Quartet, the Barlow Endowment for Music Composition, and others, they've all been amazed at this man and his music. And they've said to me, how is it possible that we didn't know about him until now? I've gone on record to say that exposure to his music is a prerequisite to Latter-day Saint arts literacy. I visited with Paco and his wife in Madrid last night, I mean, in November, meeting these, these friends of mine, or they're the children of some friends in Madrid that I met. And I have to tell you that the discovery by the church in the United States of him and his music has changed his life. Since then, he's created, a, it's just the floodgates have opened with new and daring composition, which makes me very happy, but also eats at me. Who else is out there? So, that's a lot, the three stories, that's a lot of information, but uh, back to your musical pedigrees. All three of these composers are part of your story now, right? They're your newly found cousins. 
their unique accomplishments shrink the six degrees of separation of your music world, let's say, and alter things like precedent and what is possible. Now you know them. Just a tiny bit, your pedigree has been enlarged. You are part of the same culture. But why does culture matter anyway? I think I have the best way to illustrate that is with an experience of my daughter. So she went to an all, -women univers all, all women's university in Virginia. And at that school, every student in their first semester takes this class on the great women of history in science and politics and the arts. And she wrote to me a week after entering college and said that with this single course, she suddenly felt directly connected to greatness. She described how proud she was to be a woman for the first time and that she felt that she could accomplish anything. I would say that it was the single most abrupt shift in her life. This after a single week of classes, her pedigree had grown. So if you were to walk onto the campus of Howard University, the historically black university in Washington, D.C., and asked any African-American student, have you ever heard of Langston Hughes or James Baldwin or Toni Morrison or Spike Lee or Buddy Bolden, Maya Angelou, Marian Anderson, Ralph Ellison, Ella Fitzgerald, or even Jordan Peele or Shonda Rhimes, their responses would largely transcend familiarity alone. If you asked, how have these works affected your life? I suspect that they'd respond that the works themselves would have entered into their souls and informed their lives and helped contextualize them in the world. And I'm not just referring to the lives of art majors, I mean any student. And a similar experience would likely happen if you walked onto the campuses of Gallaudet University, Bryn Mawr, or Texas A&M International University campuses and discussed art works from their respective predominant cultures of the deaf, women, and Latin Americans. Cultural talismans guide lives. And this is nowhere more evident than in subcultures. When Nobel laureate novelist Toni Morrison died on April 6th of this year, I was really touched to read various remembrances and note how her fiction affected the identities of readers. Here's a statement by Kate Tracy Smith, former U US poet laureate. I know that many of us who have devoted our lives to writing were first led to imagine such a thing were possible by Toni Morrison whose work shed life, whose work shed light upon lives, black lives, that we recognize as unmistakably familiar. Like James Baldwin, Morrison insisted that such lives were epic and poetic, and that they held the key to understanding every single thing about America. Here's another by Henry Louis Gates, Jr. For nearly half a century, we've been looking to Toni Morrison for guidance to help us think through literature as we find our way through the world. With grace and wisdom, she respected, represented, and rendered the beauty and complexity of the black experience. She was determined to defang the sort of routine, easy colorism that becomes cultural shorthand. To see the black subjective, to see the black subject irrespective of the white gaze, sometimes without recourse even to the word black. And one more from a ra reader named Brett McReynolds, who posted this on the New York Times the day after Morrison's death. Morrison's, work, work, Morrison's works took me, a white boy from rural Tennessee, and broadened my view of nearly everything I thought was true. Her works broke and reformed the lens upon which I viewed my life and the physical place that I loved. The books forced me to look deeper at the ground upon which I walked, the white Southern family experience that I called my own, all the while shattering the carefully white constructed landscape of the Deep South upon which I was brought up that had silenced and continued to silence black voices around me. Pretty interesting uh, comments, aren't these? All three of these tributes alone, in them, art modifies identity. It's not just nice entertainment. Oh, that novel was fun, that would make a good movie, right? It was a profound centering and recentering of their systems of thinking, and that is the potential for the art of our culture, too. I've been speaking today about the art of our culture. What? Is there a typo? Is the word Mormon like encoded in here that is like evil? That I... When you're a speaker and you're like, from out of town and people are laughing, it's like, okay, I, like, is the zipper up? Um, regarding our culture, um, what I want to say is 
This is not culture aimed at ourselves alone. We're not talking in an echo chamber. Rather, we are talking to the world, speaking to the world about our experiences in the world. However, the first step for us to know our it, the first step is for us to know our culture's works. Then we can share them. Okay. And now the hard question that's a little uncomfortable for me to ask. If you walked out of this building right now and stopped any student and asked about our culture's greatest artists and their personal impact on him or her, what would they say? I question whether they would have experienced that same transformative, identity-altering connection via art that is the baseline of self-knowledge in cultures elsewhere. And if not, let me provide this caution. Our inability to absorb our culture's best artworks even to identify them or to acknowledge that they exist negatively impacts us all, specifically about our church's culture. In the vacuum of knowledge regarding its art and artifacts, people assume that there's nothing of quality out there. This in turn puts unreasonable pressure on young artists like yourselves regard, uh, to be pioneers of work at the quality of the Ellingtons and Copelands and Monks and Muleys that you're studying at the university. And it adds to an assumption that contributes to self-doubt, nearly self-loathing, and it pits your artistic self against your spiritual self. It eats at your soul. You might even wonder, again, not knowing that there are great works out there and aspiring yourself to make those works, if there's something inherent in the gospel itself that tamps down such quality. or whether to have a career, you must adopt a posture that affected Jews and African Americans a century ago, the insidious, soul-destructive strategy of passing. I can strongly assure you, perhaps knowing this better than most, that the greatest works of our culture are great indeed. I rely on them and I draw from them all the time, in similar ways to my relying on the scriptures and the words of modern prophets. You might ask the question whether it's okay to want to be aspirational. Our church leaders have long encouraged you to be great artists. You already have permission, if you're looking for permission. Church artists of towering accomplishment have already paved the way for you to do your best work. The president has long since been established. However, to build on their achievement, first you have to know that our great artists existed. You can't stand on the shoulders of phantoms. What I fear you don't have is exposure to sufficient artists in the church who can model how to do it. I'm willing to help you in any way that I can. I encourage you to write to me and become part of my network in artists in the church. If I can open doors for you or point you to others that might enlarge your network or in some way give you a fuller understanding of your artistic pedigree, I'm more than happy to do it. We're going to have a Q&A in just a minute, and after that I have to go for an hour to meet with some um, BYU composition students. But after that, I'm just going to come back here and hang out in the hallway. So that would be around 2 o'clock, 1 o'clock, around 1 o'clock or so. If any of you wants to come back and chat and hang out with me and tell me what you're up to and see if there are some synergies in ways that I can help, I'm more than happy to do it. Finally, regarding our culture's artists, if you knew of them and their works, your identity would be enlarged and enriched as if you found new pages of your artistic pedigree, new relatives on the other side of the country and the other side of the world. My hope is that you'll look for them, that you'll look to them, and that they will enrich you as they've enriched me. Thank you very much. Thank so I'm looking at, at our clock, our Mountain Standard Time clock, um, and we have a couple of minutes for some questions, and I've been promised that BYU students and faculty and guests are fantastic questioners. So does anybody have a question about life or things? What's your name? Uh, Kira. Hi, Kira. It was just, um, I was just curious to know. So no, really, uh, it's, it, it's become something that became uh, a gateway to uncover cool things that have become projects, but it was just research for the sake of, the sake of it. Really. Yeah, cool. Yes, sir. And what's your name? Yes, whose name is, whose picture is, where are you?
Yeah, so on our website, which is centerforlatterdaysaintarts.org, centerforlatterdaysaints.org, um, we, began, we began an encyclopedia that's sort of a wiki model where all, um, we've listed um, not all of these 1600 composers that I referred to, but a whole lot of them, and it's in two parts. One of it is a, a narrative thing of their, their, their works and lives and so forth. The other is a full catalog of all of their works that we know. Um, we're in the process of making that cooler. Um, library science in, in the world is rapidly changing on what that is like, and we're trying to figure out the best way to do it so it can be much more dynamic. So anybody can go there, and if the works are in copyright, they can look at those works. They can maybe even download them, or if they're linked to composers' pages, or YouTube or other venues that uh, give permission, that they can experience them right there. So that's one of our, our major projects on our, and that's, uh, you know, that's on our website. I think the tab is Encyclopedia, something like that. But thank you. I know that the Center of Latter-day Saint Arts, um, they have like this yearly event, right? Where uh, people present. Is it just anybody that, that wants to present, or do you pick it, or how do you, how do you choose who's going to be there? Yeah, so, so this is a, a three-year-old organization, and for the last three years, we've had an annual festival in New York City at different venues. The first year was at Riverside Church. The last two years have been at the Italian Academy on the campus of Columbia University. This year will be at uh, Symphony Space on Broadway and 95th Street. We're also going to do um, some other events in other towns. And those things are curated by a whole host of different mechanisms. Sometimes we reach out and say, oh, I know you're, I'm aware that you're doing this really cool thing and would love to involve you. And sometimes we've had open calls for submissions that then we developed with artists. Great question. Thank you very much. What, what's your name? Jacob. Hi, Jacob. My focus has been on creative artists rather than performing artists, but what you mention is really is, is, is highly valuable because all of these artists in the church, let's say composers in particular, need advocates. So who's going to perform that music? And the fantastic thing about our current moment in the church is how many amazing performers there are out there, right? And when I talk about composers, I'm not talking about exclusively concert fine art folks. I'm talking about the people who are doing video games and film scores and TV scores and jingles and country western ballads and um, endless hymn arrangements. Not that the hymn arrangement itself goes on forever, but the number of them goes on forever. <laughs> and the, the engagement between those communities of performer and composer has been sorely lacking in my experience. Um, there, are, there are 12 opera singers at the Met in principal roles, do they know the almost 100 operas written by this crowd and their peers, for example. So we had to limit it in our own mind to creative artists because uh, what would, it would be so vast, right? right? But, and also, also we have a kind of a scholarly bias. We want, to, we want to research and uncover and advocate and tell the stories of these artists, and it seemed to me that the creative artist was the, the best beginning way to do it. Cool. Yeah, there's some amazing performers in that group, by the way. I mean, I don't, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. There's it's, a lot, of, that, there's some terrific performers among those composers, so I wouldn't pigeonhole people one direction or the other. Great, thank you very much. Anybody else? Tick, tick, tick. All right, time's up. <laughs> Thanks again, everybody. Thank you, Glenn. That was wonderful. Thanks for the good questions. Uh, uh, Glenn is going to meet with uh, composition students. There's a room uh, during lunch. There's, it's a room E536. 
we could take four or five more if any of you are just really anxious to hear more. He's going to speak about his collaborations working with Lansing McCluskey uh, on a new opera and with Ethan Wickman on an oratory that was performed a year ago, just about. Yeah. So um, thank you so much for coming, and thanks again, Glenn. Appreciate it.